Last year, I made a commitment that I would make a video every single calendar week, which meant not necessarily every seven days, but at least every like 10 or 13 days, you know. So by the time that I make a video, I have just over a week to make sure that I make another one. And one of the main reasons why I made this is I have depression and that means that I really struggle with motivation sometimes and I also struggle with getting overwhelmed and once I'm out of the loop of something, I have a hard time climbing back up. Also because one of my dearest friends who does not love creativity, she teases me a lot. We were roommates for a really long time and years later she came to visit and we were out for a walk with her dog and she said, hey Kier, why aren't you posting? And I said, you know, I'm having a really hard time and she said, that means you should post. I know that when I'm depressed, I have a hard time being creative. I also know that when I'm creative, I feel less depressed. There's something about the consistency and the juices that run in your head. And then also, the more you do something that you feel like you can at least do a little bit, you feel more capable. And then I feel like maybe I actually can do the things that feel overwhelming. And so often once I actually start talking, once I actually start reading, once I actually start planning, it feels easier because the first step into creativity, the first step into anything is the hardest thing. I don't know if you're a person like me and you struggle with depression or you struggle with motivation or it's just winter time and it's dreary and like I just have a hard time with feeling creative in this time if you're in the western hemisphere. So I felt really overwhelmed when I looked at the list of videos that I had planned to make. I felt really overwhelmed when I started to try to talk about the books that I'd read recently. I felt like there was no thoughts and I wouldn't concretely and concisely say the words that I wanted to say to describe the books that I really really loved. So instead I'm going to talk about some old favorites, some books that might help you if you are struggling with reading because I don't know, the loss of enjoyment is really hitting me this time. I'm like listening and reading and trying to immerse myself in things that I love and I'm like, no, I love this podcast. It is annoying to me right now and I know that that means that I'm not in a good headspace. But yes, I also want to do a fun thing. I have this old book of poems. This is called Poems That Live Forever and it comes many ways. It is very coffee stained. I found it in a free little library in 2020 and I carry it around and I read from it all the time and I mock it up and I write some poetry in it. I have really been struggling with writing in the last little bit and my entire life I've wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a creator and this summer really made me feel deflated. I was about to turn 26 and I was thinking am I ever actually going to amount to anything in writing? And I know that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if the things that I write are ever published. Like I enjoy my own writing. I cry at my own writing and that feels pathetic to say, but like I know that it's things that matter to me and I write. But I think that everything that I was trying to say, everything that I was trying to express just felt so childish. Like why haven't you, you know, written something that's more grown up or that's more substantial? And it all kind of goes into the, the same feeling of sometimes feeling left behind. For those of you that don't know, I have a chronic illness that really struck me at age 20 and made me hospitalized and made me have to, you know, drop out of school and to stop working. John Green has this beautiful essay called The Sycamore Tree and in there he talks about what's even the point. And it's about how our mind plays the game of what's even the point, what's the purpose, am I purposeful, all of those things. And I love his book, The Unforeseen Reviewed, and the podcast that accompanies it because I think that it has so much hope with also so much honesty. I think it's been a long time since my brain has played the what's even the point game. I don't like being here and I've never stopped dealing with depression, but I don't know, this one is hitting me a little harder than it has probably in about two or three years. And yeah, anyways, so I'm gonna recommend some books, I'm gonna read some poetry, and we're gonna have fun. The first person that I want to talk about is Lucy Maud Montgomery. She is my queen. I love her so much. And yeah, she wrote Anne of Green Gables, which everyone knows. She read The Blue Castle, which I think is just a beautiful book. It's this beautiful story of this girl who is 29 years old and her family is very pressed in and very smothering. She finds out that she's a heart condition and she may only live a year. So she says, I don't want to die without living. And it's this beautiful book of a woman falling in love with nature, falling in love with freedom and you know like some of the things that she does is like go care for a person who's outcast and I love it. I love it so much. I think that one of the reasons why Lucy Maud Montgomery is such a powerful writer is that she's not afraid of being vulnerable and showing the dark side. Like she often gets portrayed as this very fluffy person but her writing is rooted 
in hurt because she herself had a very neglected, very lonely life. There's a bit at the end of Anne of Avonlea, which is the second book in the Anne of Gable series, in which she's talking to her best friend and she says, before I met you, I was so starved of love. And I really love that part of Montgomery's writing. I just kind of looked around my shelves and at my Goodreads and my top books and I was like, ah yes, another idea of how you can get out of depression or just, you know, feel a little spark is through horror. There's nothing like fearing for your life to make you feel, hmm, yeah, this time. I find that sometimes when I'm having a really hard time, I need to feel that kind of, that, that itch of, you know, tenseness and stuff. And this is one of my favorite collections of stories ever. Shirley Jackson is very well known for The Haunting of Hill House as well as We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Those are great books. I think that The Haunting of Hill House actually deals with depression really, really good. Like the beginning of it is so well done. And this is a collection of her short stories that was published first, and I love them. Some of them are really haunting. And I love that because there isn't a lot of supernaturalness in her writing. There's just more of this like uneasiness. And I think that sometimes when I'm feeling, you know, all of these things, I feel very uneasy in my skin. And it, it becomes that. I feel like you might feel seen and also feel slightly horrified and intrigued. And, you know, I will give everything to feel slightly intrigued at this moment of just pure apathy. Another of my favorite books is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I really love this book. I read it in 2021 or 2022, somewhere in there, and it immediately became a favorite. I The first 50 or 60 pages follows the main character named Francie, and I think that she's great. But then we go back and meet her parents, who are, who are Johnny and Katie, and I think that they are just some of the most amazing characters ever. And I have quoted this so many times, I don't have the quotations here, but a big part of this is that, you know, Johnny is an alcoholic, he struggles a lot, and there's a lot about how much they love each other even though how much they hurt each other and it's a really really powerful book and it made me cry and it made me weep and it has so many great characters i opened this up and like sissy is also mentioned and she's like a full feminist character and i just i find their characters really great if i'm feeling indulgent i will record some of my quotes because i just think that they're so precious I wanted to include the book that was the last five star and also just a book that completely swept me up in this time, which is The God of Good Looks by Brienne McIver. This is so good. It's set in Trinidad. It's about this woman who we begin her life at rock bottom. She's a model with a bunch of sleazy photographers. And if we back up a little bit, her mother died when she was 14 and her father kind of checked out of her life since. She went to college in the UK and then she came back and she's had no friends. She barely has contact with her father. And in this time, she meets a man at a coffee shop and they start reading and sharing books and stuff. And soon off, she has an affair with him. And it is only several months into this affair that she finds out that not only is he married, he also is a cabinet minister. And after two years, this is revealed by a picture taking her in a compromising position. She is brandished as a slut and she's blackballed. And I think that this book is such an amazing exploration of the ways that women and men are treated differently in infidelity and in sexualized positions. And it is also just a really powerful book. It deals a lot with eating disorders and it can definitely be triggering in that way, but I I just really love this book. When I was reading it, I was thinking about one of my favorite books, which is My Dark Vanessa. And both of these books deal with a character who has a loving relationship with a man who was older, who used a lot of power to influence them and stuff and is unlearning some of those ideas. It's a character who is kind of learning that what they thought of was love is actually abuse. And I think that that's a really powerful narrative. And My Dark Vanessa is amazing. It's also very explicit and very hard. This is a book that deals with slut shaming and about all of the manipulation when actually not having any sex on screen, which I really appreciated. Like there's definitely a few references to sex in like explicit ways, I guess but they're not like lingered on scenes. They're not explicit. It's more just like his hand was here. I've spent like three days being like, do I want to reread it? Like I really loved it. And I kind of been looking for a book that is so good again. And I'm really sad because she only has a short story published and it's not available at my library. And I'm like, do I just reread it? I think that it is a book that I could reread and get so much more because you know so much more at the end than you do at the beginning. And I just thought it was marvelous. Your next option for things is nostalgia, and this might look different for you, but I thought of the Raven Boys. Maggie Strader is a queen. I love it. It is slow and mysterious and very, very funny. 
when I'm writing or having hard times, I have just like put the audiobook on in the background because it's just so funny and it makes me feel creative. Maybe I should do that. I also thought of Nevermore by Jessica Townsend, one of my favorite series. I just think that it's so magical and beautiful and I just, I feel so at home and happy and yet I cry and it deals with so many things so well. I also thought of A Torch Against the Night. I, I love that Ember and Ashes. It's just such a great series. I also thought of The Demon King and that series. I just really love you know, going back into the old fantasy, but that might look different for you. But I feel like a nostalgia choice, you know, where it's like, I don't really have to pay attention and I don't have to like be committed to more because I know this. Your next option is the nuclear option, which is often my option, which is sad books. And for this one, I have Beartown and Dear Edward. Both of these are like super depressing and yet hopeful books. You know, if you want to cry, sometimes when you're depressed, when you're having a hard time, you just want to you know, feel the pain. And sometimes it's helpful to feel other people's pain because you're just like, you kind of get out of all those feelings that you kind of almost feel blocked at and yet you're still crying and then you're able to process your own feelings because you're already in that like vulnerable open space that you can't get to because you have your walls up even against yourself. Maybe that's just me but I find that helpful. And those are just two remarkable books that deal with like really heavy topics in really sensitive and amazing ways. And then the last book on here I had The Infrasteam Reviewed. As I mentioned earlier it is an incredible essay collection that is very funny but very human and deals a lot with mental health and just seeing the beauty in other people's world. Like one of the things that I love is talking about like the third place in which like John Green is talking about him and his wife and how they barely look each other in the eyes. Instead, they're almost always looking like beside each other, looking at a third thing. And I think that's so beautiful. Like the idea that relationships are so often based on third things. Like I think of one of my best friends, Anna, and her and me both love history. And, you know, she is in her PhD program in history. And we often like read and study and like I edit her papers and we like talk about it and there's such a kindredness of loving the same thing and having that intimate knowledge and like care for each other and it's not something that's technically like I have to love but because I love it you know we love it together and we feel connected and love through that but I'm gonna do my fun thing of opening this and reading poetry I never speak loud enough or clearly enough or all of the words in the correct way but I'm just gonna I'm gonna try my best okay okay the complacent cliff dweller I have a little home amidst the city din, with a kitchenette and a shower bath and a tub thrown in, with fresh milk and vegetables and taxis close at hand. The country can't beat that, though nature is grand. The garbage is collected and I'm not concerned with where the men take it to be drowned or burned. There are lots of different places that I can go for lunch, and autumn leaves are selling at 50 cents a bunch. So this one is under humor, nonsense, and whimsy. They all have different sections. This was collected in the 1960s. I prefer like the war ones and the love ones and the friendship ones. I'm not so much into, you know, nonsense. Let's see. Ooh, this is reflection. Okay. It's called The Ways by John Oxenham. To every man there openeth a way and the ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway and the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drifts to and fro. But to every man there opened a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. It's not like my favorite, but I definitely, I can definitely see the appeal. Ooh, we have a John Donne above. I read an entire biography about John Donne, and I still don't really know who the dude is, but Catherine Rundell loves him so much. <laughs> she wrote a biography about it. Okay, this is from For Whom the Bells Tolls, from Devotions Upon the Emergent Occasions. The reason I want to read this is that I did not know that that Ernest Hemingway book comes from a quote from John Donne. No man is an island. Ah, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if the promontory were, as well as if the manner of thy friend or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore I never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Okay, part of that did lose me. But that's really cool. Like, obviously, so many of those lines are, like, famous. But I never knew the interesting idea. Okay, so when, every, when, someone, when someone is lost, you lose yourself because we are all connected. That is a beautiful thing. When we're talking about hope, John Donne, there you go. I, I can see it. I wish someone was writing. Not my favorite. But, like, man. Ooh, this one is called Victory and Defeat. Defeat may serve as well as victory to shake the soul and let the glory out. When the great oak is straining in the wind, the burrows drink in new beauty and the trunk sends down a deeper root on the windward side. Only the soul that knows the mighty grief can know the mighty rapture. Sorrows come to stretch out spaces in the heart for joy. Aw, oh, that is that is beautiful. Only a soul that knows the mighty grief can know the mighty rapture. 
I'm gonna send that to my friend. I have done it with her as well as many of my friends who love poetry. I will just open up, read a section, and we will like write a poem on it. I can't find a single poem that I wrote in here, despite the fact that I know that I wrote many poems. This will be my last one, so hopefully it's good. The Salutation of the Dawn. Listen to the exhortation of the dawn. Look to the dawn, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence. The bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty, for yesterday is but a dream and tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn. Okay, I will say that it lost me at the beginning, but that part at the end, pretty good, pretty good. And then we have Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I want to read a novel by him, but he's mostly out of print and it's very frustrating. An angel robbed of whiteless snow, bent down to kiss the sleeping night. Night woke to blush, the spirit was gone. Men saw the blush and called it dawn. Again, the end is very good. Anyways, so at dawn, we shall leave you. I feel much more hopeful at the end of this than I did at the beginning. So I'm glad I filmed. And yeah, I hope that if you're having a hard time, you reach out to someone or you read a book or I don't know. Joy is hard to find when you're depressed. And I understand that. I'm not saying go do something happy and you'll feel better. But this was a little bit of brightness in my day. And I do feel more equipped to conquer tomorrow. So I will see you next time. Happy reading and writing.